Well, we're in the seventh se uh, session of the book of Genesis. The sixth day, we've been allowing ourselves a full session for each of the days of creation. We're at the sixth day, chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. We had an introductory session on the Torah, you may recall, the book of beginnings. And we, uh, I think, demonstrated its authority, who really wrote it, and so forth. Um, we talked about day one, the, the light and all of that, day two, day three, day four, day five. Now, this, the sixth day, we'll talk a little bit about land animals and, of course, the crowning achievement, the creation of man himself. By way of review, let's just start, since we're just a few verses into the chapter, let's start with Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And if you understand that statement, accept that statement, you'll have no problem with any other statement in the entire Bible. It says it all. And the earth was without form and void. The darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved or brooded, if you will, on the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and morning were day one. Definitive construction, first day, and so forth. And God said, let there be a ferment in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the ferment and divided the waters which were under the ferment from the waters that which were above the ferment, and it was so. And God called the ferment heaven, and evening and morning were the second day. And we reviewed that in our second session, our third session, I guess it was, uh, from the point of view of the current thinking of particle physics. And the more you know about the, the leading edge of science, the more comfortable this chapter reads. Moving on, verse 9. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together in one place and let dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so, and God brought forth grass, herb yielding seed after his kind and the, the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Interesting, the sun hasn't made its appearance yet. Where's the light coming from? Good for you. Okay. Fourth day. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so, and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also and set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness and that God saw that it was good. And the evening and morning were the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And he blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the fowl multiply the earth. In the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So that's where we finished last time. And we reviewed, we, we reviewed some of the evidence of design that could not have been brought about by randomness in both the birds and, and uh, water creatures. Bring, sets the stage now for the sixth day where we're going to deal with land animals and with man. Looking at an entropy profile where entropy is randomness, and that's showing it the maximized at the bottom of the chart. We have each day a reduction of entropy, or an in intrusion of, or an insertion, if you will, of order. And the error of invoker being today, meaning evening and morning, but there is no error of invoker on the seventh day. So we're taking the view that the original meaning of those words were definitive reduction of entropy. And error of invoker made day one. And that's where we talked about the, the, the paradoxes of light itself and so forth. And then we had day two, where we have the fourth state of matter, plasma and so forth. And, and we went to day three, where we had the land and the seas and so forth. And then we, had the, we, we explored the nebular hypothesis and its fallacies and the whole creation of what we know as the solar system and so on. And uh, the fourth day. And then we get to day five with the, the uh, birds and the water creatures. That was last time. This time, of course, we have the creation of man. If you'll allow me to use Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel ceiling as an, as an idiom for the session. And uh, let's take a look at it. So we're in Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. 
And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, a test question. This is a review, in a sense. Why is it that the animals always produce after their own kind? The scripture says so, yes, but why is it operationally so? How are they defined? Is it, what? Very good. Digital. That's the word. Exactly. The DNA is a three out of four digital code. And the implications of it being a digital code is still unappreciated by many biologists, but that makes it definitive. It's digital, not analog. And uh, that's implied in here. We could talk a lot about the animals, but one of the questions that we need to raise is why, after 120 years or more of searching, have there been no missing links? You know, the, uh, when Darwin proposed his origin of the species, the, the, there's a lot of optimism that they would ultimately find all the little, the little missing links. They found zero, none of them. And that's because they are indeed, they're digitally defined. Now, there are evidences of design in each species of animal. But in the interest of getting through this session in a reasonable time, I'm just going to take one animal as an example, okay? A common animal, one that you've all seen, the giraffe. How many have seen a giraffe? These are interesting creatures. I'm going, to, I'm going to use him. This guy is just an exemplar of what you'll find if you look carefully in every something, in every animal species, you'll find something unique that required anticipatory design. Now, the giraffe grows to be about 19 feet tall. It's the tallest animal that's currently around. Weighs about 2,500 pounds. He can run about 36 miles an hour. He eats about 201 pounds of food per day. He does that spending between 60 and 20 hours eating per day. When does he sleep? He sleeps about 20 minutes a day. That's your giraffe. Interesting character. This guy's an interesting character. He can go without water for months at a time, interestingly enough. And of course, in some of his habitats, he has to. But there's some strange things about a giraffe. Being so tall, it takes quite a bit of blood pressure to get up to, to get the blood to his brain. The giraffe's aorta has about 220 millimeters of mercury pressure when he's normally standing. This pressure would be dangerously high in a human, but in a giraffe it's necessary to get the blood up to, up his long neck to his brain. And to accomplish this, he has a heart that's about two and a half feet large, long. In, 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 Huge thing. But he's got a problem. When he, when he bends down to drink water, he's got two problems at least. One is that's when he's vulnerable. That's when you would expect a lion to leap out of the underbrush that's been waiting for the opportunity to take him. The other problem he has is that the pressure would normally be enough to burst the blood vessels in his brain because it's designed to be 18 feet in the air. It's now at water level. and it would, he would have a, what, would, what a diver would call embolism, right? Well, so what, what's the answer here? Well, it turns out that the val there are valves in the artery going up to his, his uh, head that, are, that adjust. When he goes down, those valves close. The blood between the last valve and the brain goes into a sponge. It, it's diverted around the brain into a sponge-like group of vessels underneath the brain that, um, uh, uh, that's called the retim rebel, whatever that means. It's, a, it's a, uh, an organ specifically designed to absorb that pressure and to act as a, a reservoir. As he raises his, when, he, when he's down there drinking, if he was to suddenly raise his head without, he wouldn't have, he, he'd have just the opposite problem. He'd have no blood in his brain and he'd have a dizzy spell, he'd pass out, whatever. But because the, this sponge-like reservoir is there to feed oxygenated, uh, oxygenated blood to his brain when, as he comes up, the veins coming down from his head also have valves that are designed to equalize the pressure. So as, he, as his head goes from 18 feet in the ground into the water, it's sealed off. But as he comes up, the, there's a reservoir underneath the brain in the sponge-like organ. And uh, it's all, but the point is it's all been designed in anticipation of his lifestyle. Now what makes this particularly useful as an example, I want you to imagine how this evolved. 
because the deficiencies in his design are fatal. And you've got to remember one thing about evolution. Dead animals don't evolve. Okay? So if he has a blood hemorrhage and dies, there's no way to pass on that experience, however you want to fancif you know, fancifully imagine it, to his offspring. Whether it's because he, he brought, you know, because he brought his head down and had an embolism, or because not somehow having that equalized, maybe getting his head up, he would pass out when the lion's about to eat him. So, and if the lion eats him, of course, that leaves a very, very difficult fossil for, anyway, you get the idea. Okay. So what's interesting is you can find hundreds of examples where there is an essential design element, either in their skeleton or their circulation system or whatever, that is essential for their survival. And trying to conjure up out of one's imagination an evolutionary hypothesis of how it got there is an errand, it's a fool's errand. Because the defects, especially in their interim phases, are deficient and he dies. And, uh, and the survival of the fittest motif makes sure that the interim stages are gone. You follow me? So, and the, 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 anyway, the vein, so you got, you got special design of the heart, special design of the arteries going up, special design of the special sponge-like organism underneath the brain, and a special design of the veins coming down. Very, very skillful design. And what's the greatest insult you can give the designer? To assume it wasn't necessary, it all happened randomly, right? Well, let's move on a little bit. I, I, don't want, I don't want to spend a lot of time on animals because we've got a much more important topic that will interest us, interest us more centrally, and that's man. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Did you know something strange about that phrase so far? The plural, huh? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created him. Male and female created them. The word image there occurs three times, by the way. I think it's kind of interesting. We have, echoing here, a concept of the Trinity. Now, obviously, you notice the plurals, the us and our. You find that not only in verse 26 here. You'll find it in chapter 3, verse 22, chapter 11, 7. You'll find it in Isaiah. In fact, you'll find it all through the Old Testament, not just the New. And the word Elohim itself that we encountered in, you remind you in chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, is a plural noun. The I am ending, certain Hebrew nouns have, a, 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 the plural is indicated by an I am ending, cherubim and so forth. So it's a plural noun, always treated as a singular verb. And that appears 680 times in the, in the Old Testament. And yet, on the other hand, we have a problem, because many people are, of course, very sensitive to the fact that the Shema, that, 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 that uh, Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5, Emphasize that we have one God. Right? Here, Israel, the Lord our God is one. Echad. He's unified. What the word really means, unity, but okay. And Exodus 20, verse 3, in the Ten Commandments, same assertion is made. Now, that's, and many people see that as in contrast to the New Testament, which continually speaks of the plurality, the Trinity. And there's lots of verses on that. We don't have to beat that one to death. What may surprise you to discover, in fact, you need to discover it for yourself is that, see, you and I have trouble with that if we don't recognize the possibility of having plurality and unity at the same time. You, we and I tend to think those are opposites, not necessarily. There are lots of examples where you can have unity and yet there's a plurality of people involved. A corporation is a typical example, uh, where you have a corporation that's one before the law and yet can cons consist of three principles and so forth. Those are all clumsy examples for a lot of reasons, but the, the, the reason we can't visualize that because we can't imagine perfect unity. So you and I can't imagine a partnership of three people that get along perfectly. <laughs> so, so I'll leave that alone. There, it's interesting that there are in the scripture exchanges among the Godhead. And uh, uh, several of them we'll encounter as we go through Genesis. We find it several times in Isaiah. Perhaps the great example is Psalm 2. And I don't want to take the time tonight, but I encourage you in your notes to write down Psalm 2 as an assignment, and I want you to study it and make a diagram of that psalm in terms of who's speaking. Psalm 2 is a, I start to say a dialogue, that's two people, it's a trilogue, it's a discussion among three people. And you take Psalm 2 and outline it and decide who are the three people speaking. And obviously you're going to discover it, one's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
and uh, check it out for yourself, discover it for yourself, and your, these verses will be in your notes so you can follow through a number of places where there is a discussion among the persons of the Godhead. Now, another way to look at this Trinity thing, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but I want to, the creation of the universe is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 102. It's ascribed to the Son in Colossians 1.16 in the first opening verses of the Gospel of John. It's ascribed to the Holy Spirit in Genesis, second verse, and also in Job 26. And of course, all three of these are gathered in the concept of Elohim in the first verse. The creation of man is ascribed to the Father in Genesis 2.7. We'll see that next session. The uh, Son in Colossians 1.16, we looked at that before, in uh, Job 33. And also in, the creation is ascribed in plural terms to, in Ecclesiastes 12 and Isaiah 54. The incarnation itself ascribed to the Father in Hebrews 10.5, to the Son in Philippians 2.7, and uh, to the Spirit in Luke chapter 1, verse 35. The death of Christ is ascribed to the Father in Psalm 22, Romans 8, and John 3, John 3, 16, most famous verse of the Bible. The death of Christ is ascribed to the Son in John 10, 18, and Galatians 2, 20. And it's ascribed to the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. So it's interesting that you'll find verses that ascribe each of these major milestones of God's program, ascribed specifically to each member of the, the Godhead. The atonement is ascribed to the Father in Isaiah 53, twice. And to the Son in Ephesians 5, 2, to the Spirit in, in, in Hebrews 9, 14. And uh, the resurrection of Christ is ascribed to the Father in Acts 2, 24, and Romans 6, 4. To the Son in John 10, and in John 2. And the Holy Spirit in 1 Peter 3, 18, and Romans 8, verse 11. The resurrection of all mankind is ascribed to the Father in John 5, 21, and also to the Son in 5, 21. Both are mentioned there. And Romans 8, 11, the Son. The inspiration of the scriptures, by the way, there's 29 of these. I'm not giving you all of them. Just one. The point is, you, as you go through the Bible and you take the trouble to take each major event you'll be, and you look for it, you'll discover it's ascribed in different contexts to each, each member of the, of the Trinity. The inspiration of the scripture by the, to the Father in 2 Timothy 3.16, 1 John, uh, excuse me, uh, 1 Peter uh, to the Son, 1 Peter 1, and to the Spirit in 2 Peter 1. Now, the other thing, we start talking about, you, you, we get in a lot of discussion, what does it mean God made man in his own image? What does that mean? Boy, there's, we're going to talk a little bit more about the image of man in a minute, but recognize that any, any by the way, there's a basic principle I'm going to suggest to you, beyond just this issue. If you come across something that doesn't seem to make sense, praise God, because you're about to make a discovery, whatever that might be. And you do two things. First, you pray about it. It's not an intellectual exercise, it's a prayerful thing. The second thing you do is put Jesus Christ right in the middle of it and see what happens. Just see what happens. Now, this whole I issue of Jesus Christ, he was made, of course, in the likeness of men. No, no question about that. Philippians 2.7, Hebrews 10.5, Luke 1.35. At the same time, we also know from Hebrews 1.3 and Colossians 1.15 and 2 Corinthians 4.4 that he was made in he's the express image of God. That's exactly what the book of Hebrews opens up with. So if you want to try to rec you know, wrestle with this issue, what do we mean by man being in the image of God or vice versa? Jesus Christ is your, your starting and ending point. And all of these things, by the way, are anticipated in God's plan of redemption, as you'll find in 1 Peter 1.20, Revelation 17, interestingly enough, and 2 Timothy 1.9. But let's us move on, because there's lots, lots more I want to cover here. And God blessed them, notice the plural, them, See, he made Mr. and Mrs. Man. We're going to, in the next chapter, get more detailed discussion of how that all came about. But this is a summary. God blessed them and said, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply. So you know he was around. See, it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. You got that, right? Okay. All right. Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Now, don't stumble over that word replenish. Because it appears 300 times in Scripture and only, I think, a few times does it, is it turned replenish. It really means be filled. Some people try to make a whole thing on that issue of replenish. I don't want, I don't want to go there. Uh, replenish the earth and subdue it. And subdue it. See, there is your mandate for science and so forth. To subdue the earth, to understand, to search, find answers. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed which is upon the face of the, all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. So yes, they're all vegetarians at this point. That's going to change in chapter 9. So 
If you're going to be a vegetarian, that's fine, but don't make the Bible your reason. We'll get to that when we get to chapter 9. Now, you notice he makes reference here. We're talking about man, but he makes reference here to the herb-bearing seeds again. So I'm going to, I, that caused me to step back a little bit and review a few things, and I came up with some things that may surprise you. We talked, remember a few sessions ago, we talked about the anatomy of a leaf. We talked about how photosynthesis is a two-stage process. This is all by way of review. On the light-dependent reactions, how the hydrogen is used for the, and the oxygen is given off as a byproduct. And then in the light-independent reaction, the second stage of all of that, we have the glucose as a, also as a byproduct. So the plants are producing oxygen and more glucose than they need. So we notice that the plants, of course, give off oxygen and sugar. The animals need that. They give off the CO2, which the plants need. It's very fascinating to realize that the plant kingdom and the animal kingdom need each other. Take either one away, the other one ultimately vanishes because there won't be enough CO2 from lightning and from volcanoes to keep the plants around. The plants need the CO2. The animals need the O2, as well as the sugar. So it's interesting how there's an intrinsic design, an overall system design in the total package. Now, I want to show you something. We always talk about randomness. The universe came, out, came, out, came about by randomness. That's the whole premise of evolution, right? How many have ever seen randomness? Besides at Las Vegas, okay. As you look at randomness, and the intent here was to assemble random bits. And by the way, that turns out to be very difficult to do. In a computer, you can't get randomness. They have pseudo-random number generators that generate a string of numbers that may meet as many tests as they can conceive of for randomness. But they're still not really random. And, but I want, you, I want you to look at these ran, the, treat these as random numbers. Do you, know what's, do you notice what's missing? There's something missing here. Can you spot what's missing? Randomness lacks symmetry. Do you ever see random things symmetrical? See, the very concept of symmetry implies order. A center line on a drawing implies that there's an architect around. That's how they discovered all kinds of things about the architecture of the Temple Mount, because these things all line up on a center line. That has profound implications. You notice randomness lacks periodicity every third one doing something or whatever. Any, there's no periodicity. In fact, that's one of the tests of randomness. If there's any periodicity, it, it fails the test of randomness. You know what I mean by periodicity? It, it has a cycle, okay. Randomness lacks any evidence of design by definition. Because if there's design, that implies it's no longer random. And, uh, and uh, it, randomness lacks order of any kind. That's why the scientists, as they search for extraterrestrial life, listen to the noise, the randomness, in the hopes of finding some kind of order. And what they ruin out, of course, if it's periodic, every second or something, it could be generated by some natural phenomenon. So periodicity does it. You know, they're not looking for that. And, uh, but they're looking for any evidence of design. That's why random numbers are a typical conjecture. If you're trying to communicate to another alien culture, a series of random numbers is one of the ways to get their attention, presumably, because how would you generate that? Well, I got a surprise for you because there's some other, there's a, there is a sequence of numbers that, how many of you have heard of the Fibonacci numbers? There's how many? There's one, two, three, anybody else? Okay, it's interesting. I have heard about these since I was a kid. I never took them seriously. And, the, uh, and because they are the domain of some pretty strange characters. But um, back in the 12th century, Leonardo Fibonacci, he was messing around trying to predict rabbit populations. And he discovered a series of numbers that bears his name. And the first, it's one, one, then two. Each number is the sum of the previous two. Third number is two. The next number is three, which is one plus two. Then three is two plus, you know, two plus three is five. Five plus three is eight. Five and eight are 13. Eight and 13 are 21. See, each number is the sum of the previous two. You follow me? That is the Fibonacci sequence. He first, the mathematician, he first discovered it in the 12th century, but he didn't recognize the real significance. It took several hundred years for people to discover that this sequence appears in nature in some of the strangest places. The ratio of any two adjacent numbers is approximately 1.6. It varies a little bit in the second and third decimal place, but it's very close to that. And uh, now, it was several, as I say, several hundred years before the significance of the sequence is recognized. 
there is a sequence, it shows up in what's sometimes called the golden rectangle. The ancient Greeks seem to discover that there's a rectangle whose proportions are the most pleasing. And uh, they call that the golden rectangle. That's when the, the longer side is the shorter side, as the shorter size is the sum of the two sides. And that's a rectangle of a certain proportion. It's on the screen right now. That rectangle is called by artists and, and scientists and mathematicians as the golden rectangle. And it has some peculiar characteristics. The ratio of the short side to the long side, the long side is 1.618 of the short side. But the point is, if you take a square out of that, you still end up with a golden rectangle. If you take a square out of that, you end up with a golden rectangle. And, and, go, and so forth. You follow me? It's got some interesting mathematical properties. And on it goes. Okay. It turns out the Parthenon in Greece, the Great Pyramid, the United Nations Building, your credit cards, your playing cards, postcards, the switch on your light switch at home, writing pads, 3 by 5 cards, 5 by 8 cards, all of these <laughs> are based on the golden rectangle, whether you realize it or not. Okay? In, in art, Leonardo da Vinci, Van Gogh, Vermeer, John Singer Sargent, Monet, Whistler, Renoir, uh, many artists recognized that by building their art on that golden rectangle, it gave it vitality and moment, movement. And uh, it was uh, the dynamic, what they call dynamic symmetry, in contrast to static symmetry. So it implies growth, power, movement, and gives animation and so forth. And the artists have discovered that, and if you're a student of art, you're well acquainted with this. In floral arrangements, we discover the lily has three petals, the yellow violet five, delphinium eight, the mayweed 13, the aster 21, perithium has 34, helium, helium has 55, Michaelmas daisy has 89. So if you're one of these people, she loves me, she loves me not, if you know the Fibonacci numbers, you've got a chance of winning that one. Okay. <laughs> All these, of course, are in the, in the Fibonacci se sequence. There's a study among scientists called phyllotaxis, and that's where you study the arrangement of leaves around the stem of a plant. Visualize taking a plant and taking a cross section and seeing how the leaves are ordered in the plant. It turns out the elm always has one half the circumference, the beech or the hazel has one third, the apricot and the oak have uh, two every five, the pear, the poplar has three eighths. Each one of these, the almond, the pussy willow, pine trees are always five to 21 or thir to, uh, 13 or 34. These are all Fibonacci numbers. Now, first of all, they discovered this, and that was bizarre because you'll never find a number that's not in the Fibonacci sequence, which is weird. Out of 434 angiosperm and 44 gymnosperms, they all have Fibonacci numbers in their design. And scientists have discovered that that maximizes the exposure to sunlight and air without shading or crowding from the other leaves. Depends on the nature of the leaves. So this is a result of very skillful design, but the design is motivated in part by beauty. And there's a whole other thing, I didn't get a chance to do this. You go down, if you're, if you're a diver, you know if you go down 60, 90 feet or so, it starts getting bluer and bluer, pretty dark. You go down deep enough where it's dark and turn on a light, things are incredibly colorful. Why? Nobody can see them. Why are they created in the first place? For his pleasure. We have a God that loves beauty. A whole other thing I get into here, as you drive and see scenery, you never see it monotonous, except unless you're going through Kansas. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, as, you, yeah I was as I was driving in here, thinking about this talk, you know, as you go drive a mountain road, we drive through a mountain road, and there's all these trees. The trees are random, and yet they're not monotonous. The design of the trees are not predictable. Each one's different, and yet conforms to a motif. It's astonishing how you can look through nature and never see monotony. It's always got the strange variety. So about seeds. The rows of bracts on pine cones, it's 8 or 13. There's two rows. On pineapples, there's three rows. It's 8, 13, and 21. And uh, it turns out there's an optimum divergence angle of 137.5, which is, a, in effect, a fraction of the 360. That's a Fibonacci, a Fibonacci number. It produces the best packing. And that's why you always see Fibonacci, Fibonacci spirals on sunflower. If you look at sunflower, you've got two divergent spirals. They're both Fibonacci numbers. And uh, let's talk about music. How many people play music in here? Okay, you've got five keys that are the pentatonic, pentatonic scale, right? You've got eight that are called the diatonic scale. Those are, those are Fibonacci numbers. You put them both together, you've got a chromatic scale, eight and five together. A major sixth, which is considered 
for strange reasons beautiful, is a ratio of frequencies, that's three to five, uh, and a minor sixth is, uh, again, a ratio of, these are all Fibonacci numbers, all through music. For some reason, it's, it works. Certain chord, you hit two keys, some of them work, some don't. If you're a musician, you know why. But part of the reason is you got Fibonacci numbers undergirding that whole analysis. But here's the one that blew me away. I was reading up on this and I thought, that's kind of weird. If you look at the revolution of the planets in our solar system, you got Neptune. Pluto is a problem for a number of people. I won't get into that here. But you got Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, Jupiter, the, uh, the asteroid belt, Mars, Earth, and Venus, and Mercury. If you adjust the observed orbits just slightly to what I'll call here the theoretical orbits, each one is a Fibonacci ratio to the previous one. And, you say, and uh, Pluto is too, but in an inverse way, because it's 90,000 miles against Neptune's 60,000, so that's a three to two thing. But I want to stay out of that for some other reasons. Uh, Neptune, uh, Pluto is a whole other issue. Anyway, the point is, what's interesting, these are the same ratios that you find in the elm, the beech, the apricot, the pear, the almond, the elm, the pine, uh, three different uh, pine uh, numbers. You say, what on earth does the trees have to do with the design of the solar system? Very simple. The same guy did both of them. <laughs> the same guy had an had a insight of what makes things beautiful. That beauty is an elusive concept on the one hand, and yet we discover there are certain rules even in design that we find. Let's just take one more. If we take the, gold, the golden rectangle, take a square out of it, take another square out of it, take another square out of it, we have, with the golden rectangle, we can create a spiral, right? Very famous spiral, it turns out. It's the only spiral that does not alter its shape as it grows. It has that math, peculiar mathematical property. And you've all seen one. It was called the chambered nautilus shell. It shows up a lot of other places too, but I mentioned this is just a, a very crisp example. You find that in, in the hurricane, spiral seeds, the ram's horn, the tail of a seahorse, fern leaves, the DNA molecule. You'll find it in waves breaking on a beach, tornadoes, galaxies, the tail of a comet around the sun, whirlpools, seed patterns of sunflowers, daisies, and dandelions, the ears of all mammals, and especially the cochlea of the human ear. You have one in your ear that helps convert the sound vibrations into pulses that the ear can transmit to the brain. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. You remember Da Vinci's famous anatomical sketch of, uh, of man? And you take from the navel to his feet, and you discover it's a golden rectangle. Related. If you know that distance, you know how tall he is by applying the golden rectangle. And uh, you can do that. From, uh, from his navel to his chin, you'll find the length of his face. From his chin to his lips, the no tip to the nose to the pupils, uh, the pupils to the top of his head, and so forth. All these yield the distances of various parts. You'll discover the golden relationships are all through his basic design. And since man is in the image of God, in some sense, it's not surprising to find out he apparently has what we understand to be mathematically harmonious proportions. And we find that all through nature, even whether you're talking about seeds in a plant or the orbits of the planets. The, the summary of all this is if you penetrate into nature, wherever the scientist or inquirer might choose to look, you'll discover that there's been thought that's been there ahead of you. The idea of ascribing it to randomness is not only illogical and wrong, it's insulting. It's probably the ultimate insult you can give the creator, and that's why it's so interesting to me to discover that your attitude about the creation is what's going to judge you at the throne of judgment. Romans 1 hammers that, and all through the scripture you find that. Well, as you talk, talk about man, we of course should talk about all these monkey man frauds. You've heard about the Heidelberg man? You see that still in children's textbooks? It was built entirely from a jawbone that was found in 1907. Nebraska man in 1922, Henry Osborne, created the whole concept of man from one tooth that he found. And the tooth was later discovered to be of an extinct pig. Piltown man, 1912, one of the most famous hoaxes in history, Charles Dawson. He made the whole thing from a jawbone of a modern ape, but here's the key point. It was not an you know, uh, overzealousness or accidental insight. It was a deliberate fraud. In 1953, it was definitely proven. The jawbone was filed and treated with iron salts to look old and so forth. I know of no field of science that is more replete with f deliberate frauds 
than the field of paleontology or anthropology, however you want to label this field of inquiry. Pekin, Maine, 1921, that, that evidence disappeared. It also was apparently an outright fraud. The Neanderthal man, found in a cave in the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. The International Congress of Zoology in 1958 decided that it was an old man suffering from arthritis. <laughs> Java man, 1922, all made from an 1891 skull cap, 50-foot femur, a thigh bone that was found some feet away. The evidence was concealed. The, uh, the teeth were actually of an orangutan. This, again, was one of these frauds. The main point is in 120 years of searching, no intermediate stages have been found. The so-called missing link has been a, a fool's errand. Let's talk about man a little bit. And, uh, you know, this may sound strange, and I realize I run great risks of being misunderstood or misquoted here. But I have to tell you something kind of, that's just, just true. That whenever I eat and whenever I go to the bathroom, I find myself stunned as I realize how complex our digestive system is. How whatever I eat, whatever I happen to eat, the body knows what it needs and passes the rest through. And it, is so in, it knows how much it needs. And the whole complexity of the world in which we live and what we eat, the way our body takes that in and deals with it all, and all the various organs that correct the errors and the excesses, gets rid of the sugars, or the, you know, the liver, all that, the, the, the digestive system. When I first started, I was going to try to do a diagram, and it would have taken us an hour just to explain a little bit. I'll just scratch the surface. Um, the circulatory system, your blood vessels, the way your blood responds to er emergencies is astonishing. The way it fights invaders and so on. Your respiratory system. We talked a little bit about the giraffe. The human is, 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 has its own complication. Your sensory systems, the eye. Compare your eye to the most sophisticated digital camera you can buy. It's vastly more sophisticated. Uh, the ears, the uh, proprioceptive system, your ability to keep balance and know where you are with your eyes closed and so forth. All these things are not trivial. Your immune system. Boy, one thing we're learning today is that scientists don't understand our immune system. The fact that you can have a retrovirus it changes the master record in the database of your cell. Boy, that, that's, that's, and the nervous system. Let's just take one of these and talk about it a little bit. I'll pick the nervous system. We have our brain, right? And we could go through all the different things they think they know about it, but as you start getting into that, they give you fancy words for things they don't really understand in the first place. Because by the time you go through the brain, you discover a great deal of it deals with the glands that are right under the, the, uh, the, uh, the brain proper. The pituitary gland is the master gland of them all. The growth hormones, the thyroid stimulating hormones, the antidiuretic, they're, all, they're just a whole family of these things where it is monitoring and controlling your whole body processes from a central control. And you start looking at the autotomic uh, nervous system. It's, you know, there's a, there is a uh, sympathetic version, and that's the one that activates in times of stress, in times of emergency. It does all kinds of things. It's, it's amazing how it integrates all the way through and uh, the parasympathetic division, which controls the maintenance, the normal routine functions. And whether it's a, uh, and each element in your body has both roles. And uh, it's interesting, that's why you'll discover that we don't think of a person's actions as emanating from his head. We say so-and-so sure has guts, doesn't he? You see? Oh, does he have heart for the job? See, we, we find ourselves drawing on idioms, we don't mean literally the heart that pumps the blood, it's our way of capturing his volition, not even presuming that it's confined to this organ that happens to be in our head, per se. Because we somehow just know from our experience that our real responses and actions affect our whole body. That's why you get ulcers when you're under stress. Your brain doesn't get a problem, you get an ulcer, right? Whatever, see? And, and uh, so we can go through all of that, but you, the reason I want to bring this in, see, the human brain, they estimate has about 10 to the 10th nerve cells. Now, you've been enough with me with these large numbers know that we have no idea what 10 to the 10th means. Um, each one of these has somewhere between 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 5th connecting fibers. So we're suddenly dealing with a very large net. That's one reason they don't understand how the brain works, because we don't understand super, we know that large networks operate differently than small ones. So if you have this, if you have 10 to the 5th connecting fibers, 10 to the 10th nerve cells, you've got about 10 to the 15th connections in your brain. Well, what does that mean? What's 10 to the 15th connections mean? Well, imagine you had 
a tree with, every tree you could find had 50,000 leaves on it. That's probably a very high estimate, okay? And let's assume you had 10,000 trees every square mile. Every tree has 10, 50,000 leaves. You got 10,000 per square mile. You would need 2 million square miles of these, a forest the size of the United States, to get the equivalent connections in your brain. And it has, if it's a highly organized network of uniquely adaptive channels. See, that's part of the problem. The channels aren't fixed. They're flexible. And that's, so it's, it's what the von Neumann architects would call an infinite state machine. Now, if you have adaptive communication channels, let's assume only one out of 100 were specifically organized pathways. Then you still represent a greater number of connections than the entire communications network on the planet Earth in your brain. So it's no surprise they don't really understand how it works. There's lots of research going on, but a guy by the name of Walter Penfield assumed that memories have specific locations in the brain. When they did lobotomies and things, they, they've come to conclusions. However, Carl Prybrand uh, proved that memories are not localized. There isn't a particular cell that's representing what you, you're one of your childhood memories, per se. And Paul Peach, using 700 operations on salamanders, confirmed, Prybrand, that your memories are diffused, not in a location. They're non -loca they have non-locality. John von Neumann, the famous computer architect, pointed out that uh, he believes the capacity of the brain is about 2.8 times 10 to the 20th bits of information. That's 1,000 bits per second for 10 million years. That's a lot of data. That's a lot of data. Now, Hermann von Helmholtz discovered that ear your ear processes sound by a frequency analyzer. That is sophisticated audio engineering. And there's probably not, you know, only a few, in a small percentage of engineers that really understand Fourier transforms in the audio. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. The, the uh, Russell and Karen de Valois discovered the visual cortex in your eye processes images by Fourier transforms. See, it's, it's been a big mystery. The, the most sophisticated job that computer programmers have had is pattern recognition. How, can I, how do you recognize an A even if it's upside down? Turns out that's, a very, that's one of the most sophisticated problems in computer is, 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 for, is uh, opt, opt, optical character reading. Even, they put all kinds of constraints to try to improve the efficiency, but it's, it's, a, it's a mystery how, how we really perceive, how, how we do pattern recognition. Holographic models are the only way to explain these neurophysiological puzzles, pattern recognition being one of them. That's a big mystery, how we recognize things, even if they're reverted, upside down, or twisted, we still recognize them. The other, the transference of learned, learned skills is another issue. One of the issues is phantom limbs. We don't know how that happens. People have an arm amputated, but they still have pain in the tip of their finger that's not there anymore. There are all these kinds of issues that doctors are chasing. So there are, there are other problems in this area, how you discern internal versus external realities. The more you analyze that, the more mysterious it becomes. Also, imagination, inspiration, and cre creativity are uh, uh, things that go far beyond simply storing recall information processing. And they're trying to understand that. There are some that conjecture that the brain may not be where it's happening anyway. That it may be a hyperdimensional transfer function of some kind to other dimensions beyond our own consciousness. There's no evidence for that that's reliable and yet at the same time it's provocative. But this leads us right into the key part of tonight and that's the architecture of man. Man's created in, in, in the image of God. It's interesting, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, Paul says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You notice those three words. This is where we get the notion that there is, in a sense, the trinity of man. You have a spirit, you have a soul, and a body. And there's no use going to the field of psychology to understand the spirit because it can only be discerned. Hebrews 4.12 says, it's only discernible by the, the Word of God. But let's take a look at this. You know, the body, soul, and spirit, the trifold nature of man. If you look at the Hebrew, they have a word in nefesh that, we would, that comes close, but not quite, to being the soul. It's used other ways, too. But see, we use the word soul loosely, too. A ship went down with 100 souls on board. Gee, you mean the bodies are still okay? No, we use that term as a synecdoche. It's, it's, it's a figure of speech. And, of course, they have the word ruach, which means wind, but also spirit, right? And a various word for body, depending on what context you're using. The word nefesh, which means soul or self-life, creature, person, it's used in many ways in the Hebrew. 
But out of 751 occurrences, 475, it's translated soul. So it's a word, if you're trying to say soul, it's the word you'd probably use, but it is used other ways uh, with, with less frequency. And uh, it, it's used three ways, really. The physical, it's used of the physical life about 150 times in the Old Testament. Adam's body was complete yet unanimated until God placed in it the spirit of life. It's also used in a figurative sense, as all these words are. It's a synecdoche for the whole person. A synecdoche is when you put the, the uh, specific, meaning the general. Hey, will you lend me a hand? I don't want just your hand. I want your feet and your body. I want, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's what's called a synecdoche. And uh, so, so it's used that way too. And the third way, the most, the most uh, general way, is the inner being, the transcendent self. The main point is it departs at death and returns with life at the resurrection. You find that all through the Old Testament. And uh, it's all to that which, to which is a tribute, reason, emotion, will, and worship, and so forth. And that's from Briggs Driver and, uh, Brown uh, Driver and uh, Briggs, the, one of the principal lexicons. Now, in the rabbinic literature, it's understood that the soul, to be referring to the soul that's invisible and immortal. This is, a, this is just fundamental stuff here. I mention this because there's lots of weird heresies that come out by not understanding this. Josephus points out that all Jews except the Sadducees believed in the immortality of the soul at his time. Sadducees, of course, were conspicuous because they had a different view. That's why they were sad, you see. Uh, Eusebius, Eusebius also points out that the doctrine of soul sleep was invented in the third century by various heretics. But there's another word called ruach, which can mean breath or wind, but it's also used for God. Holy, the Holy Spirit's also used occasionally for angels, life in men, other, it has other usage too. And, uh, but uh, it's used spirit 232 times, wind 92 times, breath 27, uh, other meanings. For out of 378, 273 are, uh, 232 are, uh, out of 378 are spirit, uh, spirit as opposed to air. When the Hebrew is translated into Greek, the word nefesh, it's the psyche, it's translated into suki in the Greek. 785 out of 810 cases. And the Greek language is more definitive, more, more precise. The Greek never uses bios as the Greek word for physical life, as if it was the equivalent for nefesh, never. And, um, and, it, and the Greek deliberately avoids equating the soul with mere physical life, because it's immortal. It's a word from which psychology is derived, by the way. And uh, now, so the Greeks also have three words, psyche for, for the, the, what we would call the soul, Pneuma for what we would call the spirit or air. That's where we get the word pneumatics, you see, and soma for the body. And uh, so psyche means, can, can mean the breath, the breath of life, and so forth. And uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the essence that differs from the body, and it's not dissolved by death. And uh, again, uh, it, it's used uh, more than half the time. It means just that. And uh, it also can mean the new movement of air, like the breath of nostrils and so forth. And that's where we get the word pneumatics and so on. And uh, so let's move on here. Um, it's also used as a proper name of the third person of the, of the Trinity. And uh, so we have, again, out of 385 uses, uh, 137 are spirits in general, Holy Ghost in 107, the Spirit of Christ 19 times, the human spirit 49 times, and so forth. So it's used very, in the Greek usage, it's pretty clear. Now, as we look at Psyche and Nephesh, they're almost the same, but not quite. So you want to be on your guard because people will take the differences and try to build doctrines on them, which is dangerous. Any place that these things don't quite overlap creates ambiguities or figures of speech and that sort of thing. So one has to, it's not as denotatively precise as you'd like. And so likewise, when we use in the English body, soul, and spirit, likewise, we're close, but not, we need to look very carefully at what's really being said and not try to build doctrine on the little differences between the two. Okay, let's talk a little bit here. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and all thy mind. The great command, the greatest of all the commandments, right? He's quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy 6, right? Well, what, how, how many of you love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and with all thy mind? Before you put your hand up, I'm going to ask you to tell me what you mean by heart, soul, and mind. See, we glibly say that. Do we have any idea what we mean by heart? Do we mean this Organ that pumps our blood? No. Uh, soul, again, is have all the ambiguities we talked about. And with all thy mind, what does that mean? And so one of the things we, we suffer here because we don't really understand our architecture. What make, what's the difference between our heart 
our soul, and our mind. Are these three words that are just figures of speech for the same thing? Or are they definitively different? Well, it's interesting that seven times in the Bible, it's declared that you are the temple of God. Now, that might be just a figure of speech, meaning because you're the resident of the Holy Spirit, so that's, you're the temple of God in that sense, and I won't quarrel with that. But seven times it says this, and I want to explore the possibility that there may, this may be the key that unlocks our visibility to our own internal architecture. The heart, soul, mind, spirit, what do these things mean? Well, let's go back and understand the temple to begin with. Obviously, we go back to the Old Testament with the tabernacle, which you could, in a sense, is the first temple. It's so described in Samuel. Um, and, of course, it was 75 by 150 feet, but that's it. You came in, you saw the brazen altar, altar of sacrifice, and then you had this laver, and then you had the, the tabernacle proper, the naos. And as we look at that, as you walked in, on the right side was the table of showbread, and on the left side was the seven-branched candle, the menorah, and... Uh, they had the holy place, the holy of holies, the inner sanctum, if you will, the menorah, the table of showbread, and the golden altar. The golden altar always associated with the holy of holies, but just outside of it, so it could be tended, because only the high priest could go in the holy of holies, and then only once a year after great ceremonial preparation. And of course, inside you had the holy place, you had the ark of the covenant, and you had the mercy seat, which are both separate, always described separately. And we've been through all that. Let's go on to another thing here. It's interesting that every detail of the tabernacle speaks of the Messiah. And, and, and we could spend a whole hour on that. He makes a claim that I am the door. Anyone that comes through but by, but by me is a thief and a robber. I am the light of the world, he says in John. I am the bread of life. He makes intercession for us, which with the golden altar being the, the prayers of the saints. He's our sin bearer, of course, and he makes propitiation for our sins, and we believe that the, the uh, mercy seat will be the throne that he reigns from in the millennium. So, but let's get on with this, this, this whole idea. When, we, when you get to Solomon, let's remember that Solomon had, God gave Solomon some specific instructions. The tabernacle was given to Moses, and he made, built that. When you get to the days of Solomon, God appeared to Solomon, and he had his design. I, did, I, I startled to discover this, that that design was given to him by the Lord. Now, we recognize as we look at Solomon's temple that it's just like the tabernacle, just twice as big, much bigger, much more elegant. But it has something that the tabernacle didn't have. It has two, a couple of primary things. It has a place called the porch and two pillars, Yachin and Boaz. And it also had a whole bunch of storerooms around that, were ac that the priests had access to, where they stored their personals. So we had the holy, so holy and holies, holy place, just like the tabernacle. But the porch is something new. And you had the inner court and the outer court. And on the inner court, you had the molten sea, which is a quaint translation for this big brass laver and the uh, Holocaust altar and so forth. The personal stories for the priest. Now, it's interesting, if you want to get into this, my wife's book, The Way of Agape, deals with this in practical terms. You want to discover this if you haven't. Outer court referring to the body, the inner court, the soul, the heart, and the spirit, and uh, the willpower, the volition, being represented by the porch. And it's astonishing how much of your personal walk will be affected if you understand the role of each one of these things. And especially these wooden chambers where the priests stored their secret idols and such. And uh, uh, you need to clean those out. And you can't. The Holy Spirit will if you let him at his timing. But uh, anyway, we'll get on here. I want to talk a little bit further about, we talk about architecture. See, I want to talk a little bit about computer architecture. I got a computer up here. and. Uh, uh, you can't tell how it behaves by the hardware. You can know everything about every circuit and still not tell how it works. Inside this computer, you've got a central processing unit. You've got some electronics that let you communicate with it, a keyboard, a monitor, whatever. You also have a memory. The processor can, has access to a place to store information. And what makes the computer unique, not simply a, a fancy calculator, is that in the memory, you not only have data, but you also have software. The programs that run the computer are also in memory, and the computer can alter those programs. And that's what gives it its incredible power as an information appliance. But you still can tell nothing about its behavior until you understand what software is running. You know, it can, it can be an Apple, it can be a PC, that's meaningless. You've got to know what software is running inside, that's the key part of it. So let's take a look at how the software is organized. The software has, is primarily what they call an operating system, a super program that manages everything for you. That makes it hardware independent. 
then you have a user interface. Some way it presents itself to you. If you're a naive user, there's a very easy, comfortable, user-friendly style. If you're a very sophisticated programmer, there's more complex ones, different kinds of interfaces available. Inside that is a memory. It takes care of your memory management. You don't want to fool with that. You don't care where a certain number physically is. You just want to be able to get at it by a name when you need it. And it takes care of all that. And then inside there also you got all, not one, but probably several different application programs. Now the point I want to make here is there's no way for you to understand how those programs are organized. That's why you can go to a computer store and buy one and use it all you like. But you can't unravel it and see how it works because it's, it's uh, uh, in machine language. And uh, it's all, uh, it's not accessible directly to you. So the only way to find out the architecture of those programs is to look at the designer's manual. And now let's talk about software characteristics. Software includes self-modifying codes. Software is generated from high-level languages down to the machine code. So its architecture cannot be inferred from its external behavior. Now the other thing I want to point, and this is a key point, the software has no mass. I can transmit software through airwaves. Let me demonstrate that to you. If I had one of these disks here, you all seen, you've all seen a diskette. If I had a blank diskette and I put that on a postal scale, it'll weigh about seven-tenths of an ounce. It's blank. If I spend hundreds of dollars and load it with over a million bytes of software, what does it weigh? Seven-tenths of an ounce. See, it has no mass of its own. It's like a light switch. It weighs the same whether it's a one or a zero, whether it's on or off. You follow me? Same kind of an idea. Software has no mass. Well, see, time, we learned in our earlier sessions, is a physical dimension. Time varies with mass, acceleration, and gravity. Software has no mass. So it has no time dimension. Now, my dilemma in trying to deal with this is I look out here at the audience, I can't see you. It's not a question of lighting. I can't see you. I can only see the temporary physical residence you reside in, the real you. Call it soul, spirit, give it what vocabulary you like. Is software, not hardware. You happen to be resident in a temporary dwelling. The dwelling I'm in has a little too much mass. <laughs> but that doesn't say anything about the software. And the analogy that always pops in my mind, I can remember as I was traveling, I, I, since I write a lot and I travel a lot, I'm very dependent on a laptop. I had an old uh, laptop that finally died, gave up the ghost, if you will. And I was in big trouble. And some friends of the ministry realized my predicament and gave me, treated me as a gift to the top of the line at that time laptop. And I'll never forget that day because I loaded it with all my favorite tools, my favorite Bible programs, my favorite files, my favorite word processor, all that stuff. And it all came up working, except it ran about 100 times faster, literally. And it was in full color. I'll never forget that. See, I had a black and white thing. See, I was, I was blown away with how much gain I had and still familiarity with everything. I didn't have to change anything. Everything I was using still worked. It was recognizable. And the reason I want to bring this up, see, you are heading for an upgrade. Okay? The real you has no mass. The real you is eternal, whether you like it or not. That's the problem. Where are you going to spend it? If you're perfect without fault, so that you can be in the company of the supreme being that we all worship, that's great. I don't think any of us are. But fortunately, your eligibility for that destiny has been paid for by the only guy that could afford to do it. And uh, it's available for the asking. It's interesting. I want to talk about Frank Tipler. He's not a believer. He's, not a, he's, he's, he's just one of these super bright uh, scientist. He's a professor of mathematical physics at Tulane University, Frank J. Tipler. Um, he's an expert in cosmology, particle physics, information sciences, all these leading edge areas. And he decided to take on a project. Scientists of that kind are very familiar with the whole family of models they call the Big Bang. And they're also aware of the fact that thermodynamically the universe is ultimately going to suffer a heat death. Those are two fields of study. And Frank tried to tie them together, see if he couldn't put these together in some comprehensive model. And as he un undertook that, using the most advanced and sophisticated methods of modern physics, we're talking just physics now, he, the, 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 the physics event, like, uh, in exactly the same way physicists calculate the properties of an electron, he arrived at two conclusions that startled him. The first conclusion won't surprise you, probably. He discovered proof of the existence of God after the Judeo-Christian concept. He came to that conclusion from the field of physics alone. You say, no kidding, Dick Tracy. You know. 
Listen, any time a PhD discovers his redeemer, that's a miracle of the first order. It's, one, it's every one of us that know Jesus Christ is a miracle of God's doing. If you have a PhD or an H2SO4 behind your name, it's even a bigger miracle. But anyway. But the second discovery he made may surprise you. He also now believes that every human being who ever lived will be resurrected from the dead. He recognized from the fields of physics that, the, that uh, every life that's ever lived is destined for a post-resurrection experience. Bizarre, isn't it? Now, I don't recommend his book. It's full of differential equations you probably wouldn't follow anyway. And you can learn more from the most important chapter in the Bible than you can from his book. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Paul will tell you that. Without chapter, we have nothing. The chapter on resurrections. But let's get back to our text. First, Genesis 1, 30 and 31. God says to every beast of the earth and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So the creation is now complete. It's six days, not seven. It's completed. It's the sixth day. The definite article is uniquely used here. And it stresses the fact that it's now complete. There is a translation. It was in Aramaic, of the, it was of the Torah in Aramaic in, in about uh, 150 A.D. And it is so highly venerated among the rabbis, it's called the translation, the Onkelos translation. It renders that last verse a little differently. We say it was very, very good. The Uncle's translation says it was a unified order. And there are some that believe, some scientists and such, that believe that the scientific laws as we know them were unified at this point. At this point. In other words, it, became, it was a unified order. There's going to be an interruption in that in Genesis chapter 3, a curse pronounced. We don't know anything about what happened between chapter 1 and chapter 3 from a physics point of view. We'll discuss that when we get to chapter 3. Everything we know about the earth is post-curse. In fact, it's even after the flood. There are two big discontinuities, the flood, of course, being the most recent, but also the events of chapter 3. We'll deal with that when we get there. So suddenly, now, next time, we're going to talk about the seventh day. And the seventh day is bizarre for a number of reasons, not the least of which there's no evening and morning. And that's the first clue that those words originally meant something different. They later became to mean evening and morning. Saying it was evening and morning was a day doesn't re just saying that the, the Jews measure the day by starting in the evening doesn't explain it because by morning that day's over. You got to be kidding. See, it sounds like it's just talking about the night. So it, 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 there are some logical problems there. The the uh, the, the possibility that the word erev and boker had an early meaning uh, of of uh, that became later to mean evening and morning. But whatever it is, there's no error in Boker on day seven. We're going to talk about why next time. So we've talked about the introduction of the Torah. We've talked about the, the so-called gap theory and, and the, the, the advent of light. We talked about the, the fourth state of matter and all that. We talked about the origin of life on the third day. We talked about the nebular hypothesis on the fourth day. The fifth day, the whole idea, fallacy of evolution in general. And then the sixth day, we've reviewed this time. Next time, we're going to recap the creation of Adam and specifically focus on the advent of Eve and what all that means. We'll talk about why there's no Adam and Boker. We'll talk about the possibility that God imposed a repose on the universe. We'll talk about the Sabbath day in prophecy, not just looking back but looking ahead. And It'll startle you perhaps to discover that the temple in the millennium will only be open on Shabbat and the new moons. And uh, well, it's a uh, We'll look into some of that. And we'll also talk about the role of marriage. We're going to discover that the, God has a purpose in the marriage that may surprise you. It is far more than simply the orderly way that God ordained to raise a family. There's much more going on there. We'll talk about that because it shows up all through the Scripture. Let's stand for our closing word of prayer.